So I went in and with John I was told I had a uh, lung disease that was incurable and that um, I had a very limited lifespan. And it depended on the progression of the disease and they'd try and slow it down, but there was no cure. It was a huge shock. I never ever thought I would have a health issue, never. Honestly, everything was swept away from underneath me and I was dying. Yeah. I was dying. Hi, I'm Lizzie Oakes and welcome to Finding the Light. My guest today is Naomi Cowan. Naomi is the CEO of Equip Mental Health Services based here on Auckland's North Shore. And a couple of years ago, she received a New Zealand Order of Merit for her services to mental health and to the community. She's an incredible woman. I've met her a few different times and I've always thought I'd like to have a bigger conversation with her. I just wasn't expecting the conversation we'll be having today. Since I last saw Naomi, she was diagnosed with a rare lung disease, which led to a lung transplant. She's had ongoing challenges, and so I'm looking forward to sitting down today and hearing her story and her words. You know, we've got quite a big topic to talk about, mm. but I actually thought, just to get to know you a little bit better, if you could sort of take us back and tell us a little, little bit about your childhood and, and where you grew up and, and that kind of thing. I grew up in Otago, in Dunedin. I was born in Blenheim, but we moved to Dunedin when I was very young. And I grew up in a Presbyterian family. Good, and I've got a good family. Yeah. And church was a big part of our lives. And mum and dad volunteered. So I learned about service very much from my immediate and extended family. Mm. I um, went through school, and about, at about age 15, I got a genuine sense of call that God was going to use me in some way. He wanted me to serve him. And so probably I should have got a little bit more thorough career advice. But on the strength of that, I thought, well, I'm going to go and study something that means my nights are free so I can help with youth group and serve. Because <laughs> <Okay. laughs> I looked around and saw my friends who were doing nursing and things. They were doing shift work and couldn't come to a lot of stuff. Um, but now working in mental health, I kind of wish maybe someone had nudged me. I was going to do occupational therapy and I decided it sounded like, yeah, I wouldn't have enough time to serve. So I didn't do it, but it would have been handy now. Yeah, yeah. I went off and just learnt to be a secretary, to be honest. Mm. And then I ended up working for Youth for Christ as their secretary. And that really became the start of my whole career of working in not-for-profits. And from there, I... Um, trained to become a worker with kids that were at risk, if you like. And then they sent me to Nelson to start a program there. And then Youth for Christ sent me to Timaru to do a program, some work there. And then I met my husband, John, through Youth for Christ. Okay. And so it went on. So that those were the early years. Yeah. Very much defined by a sense of call. Mm. Mm. So that was a little bit of your beginning. Yeah. And then how did you end up coming to work here at Equip Mental Health? My husband John and I had been pastoring up in the Bay of Islands and we moved back to Long Bay Baptist and he was the youth worker part-time. And so there was always a need to find part-time work. And he'd been working for this trust, um, which was called Tiara Ho back then, but it's now called Equip. Mm -hmm. And when he went full-time at the parenting place, the manager, Annette Denham, said, oh, do you want his hours? Because the kids were getting a bit older. And I said, oh, I don't know anything about mental health. And she said, that's all right, we'll teach you. So my first day at work, I was in at the medical school on a two-week course, learning all about mental health conditions and how to support people. Wow. And it just went from there, really. I did hours that worked around the kids and um, helped John with parenting place presentations and things like that. And then when the manager moved on, they said, oh, how about you become the manager? And back then there was like, I think, five staff. And I went, oh, well, what could go wrong, really? And if it does, I'll just be a support worker again. So I went, OK. And um, then they said, well, you've got to grow it now. So <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so if we fast forward now, we have about 80 staff across the Auckland region and we provide a range of services to help people who experience mental health issues mm. get on with their lives. Yeah, that's amazing, isn't it? That's really cool. Yeah. 
A few years ago, you got that um, special award. Oh, yeah. Tell us about that. Oh, yeah, and the post came this letter looking very official with the royal stamp on it or parliament or something. And it was an, I was being awarded a member of the New Zealand Order of Merit. Mm. I went on behalf of the team and I got it. And mm. it was lovely, very honouring. Mm. So tell me a little bit about your journey since I last saw you in terms of your health. Yeah, so I had this persistent coughing mm. and everyone thought it was asthma. But I think it was three summers ago out at PR in the caravan. It just was so bad. I couldn't really do much without this ongoing cough, 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 cough. So, you know, with family support and persuasion, I went off back and basically other tests were done. And then I got the call and I was sitting in this office. So my desk was over here at the time. And I got this call saying from the specialist saying, Naomi, we now know we have a diagnosis and you need to come in and see me. And I think it's time you bring family. And I remember walking out the door down the passage to the GM mat and saying, I've got to go to a meeting and bring the family. That's not good, eh? And, and he gave the perfect response, which was, yeah, that doesn't sound good. Like he didn't pretend or sugarcoat it. Yeah. So I went in and with John, I was told I had a uh, lung disease that was an incurable and that um, I had a very limited lifespan. And it depended on the progression of the disease and they'd try and slow it down, but there was no cure. Wow. It was a huge shock. I never, ever thought I would have a health issue. Never. So you've always taken pretty good care of your health? Um, well, I've been a good, clean person. I didn't drink, I didn't smoke, I didn't do all that stuff. And, and I come from a, a line of hearty women, mm. you know, that my grandmother lived to 100. My own mother's 96. So, you know, we just don't do sickness. Mm. And how did that sort of, that news reverberate through the family, you know? Oh, look, they were great. And I just decided straight up, um, we're not going to play secrets with this and withhold information. I'm just going to tell those that I think care about yeah. me. Yeah. You know, we're all very modern. We've got WhatsApp groups for the family and all that kind of stuff. So I just told them. Mm. And they were hugely supportive. Yeah. I mean, I, I had been told I might qualify for a lung transplant, mm. but there's massive demand. And, you know, I might not get through the selection process for yeah. various reasons. So that was a faint hope. At that time, you know, you're living your life. You're yeah. the CEO of here and yeah. your busy life. With that news, how did that sort of impact you and your relationship with God? Hugely, because really up to that point, by and large, I think I'd had a pretty transactional faith. To me, it was like if you build a bit of credit, if you do the right thing, um, God may step up when the crisis comes because mm. you've put some credit in the bank. Right. Very much a, so a work, what can I do for God? What a work faith, faith sort of thing? Yeah. Yeah. Whereas I found that didn't serve me well during that time because I completely lost control of a situation mm. and there was nothing I could do. Now, I'd had a little taste of that two years earlier when our firstborn grandchild died full term mm. and that was the start of the transactional faith not working as well and I chose to dig deeper yeah and I found a soul relationship with God which is very hard to describe but if it took that to get me to that or I'm on a journey with that mm. it's been worth it what does a soul relationship with God look like to you the best way I can describe it is giving up my ego my need to control a situation, my need to have things focused on me and to just let go, mm. to really let go. And I remember walking around the car park here listening to a podcast about when adversity comes to you, can you actually welcome it? Can you bow down to it? Wow. Can you invite it in as your teacher? Wow. And I heard this at about this time and I just thought, you know what, I'm going to try that because I don't know what else to do and I'll have to believe God's in that. And I really have to say he has been. Yeah. And it's much more understanding. I don't actually have to do anything. I just have to be open and go with the flow. Yeah. And I found God with me in that. And I found him in other people in ways I didn't expect. Is it a little bit like you're at the beach and there's this huge wave coming for you and you think, oh, I'm going to stand and resist this and it pounds you or else you just kind of go underneath it mm. and let it flow over you? Could you say, is it a bit like that? It is a bit like that. Mm. It's a bit like drowning underwater, but you're not. Um, yeah. Because 
I think our natural impulse is to try and preserve, to fight, to... Yeah, have um, some sense of control. Yeah, figure it out somehow. And if I pray enough, God will sort it. I mean, honestly, everything was swept away from underneath me and I was dying. Yeah. I was dying. And even if I got a transplant, it may not mm. be successful. So I was, I think it's a God thing that I was able to be incredibly realistic about it. I stared it in the face and thought, okay. That's Don't brave. us as Christians spend our whole life waiting to go to glory. I'm going to go a bit earlier. Yeah. Why are we so frightened of it if that's, you know, part of our walk with God? Mm. I just found a calmness came over me, which I'm not sure I can manufacture. Mm. I'm, an, I'm an extrovert, so I bounce around. And I just felt this incredible calm. And other people noted it. They said, how come you're so calm? I wasn't Pollyanna-ish. Like, it was really hard, some yeah. of the treatments I had to go through and stuff. But yeah. I did feel I could really trust God in it. And I took his calmness as a sign of his presence. Mm. Mm. His peace that passes understanding. Yeah, it was very tangible. That's so good. Mm. So they gave you the diagnosis. Mm. And as you said, you know, you didn't sort of know where or what or how. And then somehow you ended up getting a lung transplant. Now, I would imagine to get on that list would be quite difficult. Oh, yeah, it is. And um, <clears throat> the specialist said, look, I'm getting older. You're getting older. Let's get this in motion. You don't need it yet. but Because um, I also was determined I will control what I can control. Mm. So I will keep walking and stay fit. You know, I will do. I sorted out my PowerPoint from the funeral. I mean, you don't leave that to chance, do you? Those <laughs> random photos people might put up. I got that all sorted. And <laughs> I did a few things like that. But he said, let's get you going in the system. Because he was part of a wider group that had the transplant team in it. He said, they're quite interested in you because you don't have any other physical conditions, mm. which usually people do. And nobody else in the family had ever had this no, disease? No, So anyway, lo and behold, next thing I get a call and they want to do all the stuff that they do to check, check you out to see if you'd be suitable. Okay. So um, meanwhile, I was on some heavy meds to try and slow down the progression, mm. which had side effects and everything, but I was able to still work. Really, I was able to still work because we're all in lockdown with COVID. Right, you so know, you could work from home. I know a lot of people hated COVID, but to be honest, lockdowns were great for me. Yeah. <laughs> and um, we just, I just kept working. And um, so anyway, I went through all these tests, which are quite invasive, and they're checking out that, A, you'll survive the operation, you have a reasonable chance of it, and that, you know, you're going to, well, be compliant and stuff like that. So went through all of that, and then I got the phone call, which was very emotional. Naomi, we'd like to put you on the list if we do, would you accept? Because not everyone does. No. Because um, you may not get through it. And how long's the list? Do you know? I don't know. Don't ask. They don't tell you. And the list isn't a list. Like, it It depends on what the donor is yeah. as to who might be a good match. Mm. Anyway, I had one more tr thing I had to do, check my heart or something, and then I got the call, OK, you're on the active list now, and you probably won't wait long because you've got a blood type that you can take any lung. So I went home, packed my bag, like when you have a baby, you know, I packed the bag. Yeah, <laughs> waiting. Wrapped up the presents, the Christmas tree was up, everything was all go. Because again, part of stress is let's control what we can control. For sure. But then you can trust with the other stuff. Mm. And then I got this call at 9.30 at night. How long was the wait after one they month, told you? One month. Just a month. And it was just, you know, I was heading off to bed, Naomi, we think we've got a nice lung for you. Um, can you be in in half an hour? Wow. So that was the deal, you couldn't kind of go away or anything? Yeah, you can, you just got to let them know. Oh, OK. Um, and so you had to be there in half an hour? Yeah, which was easy at that time of night. And it was just before Christmas? Yeah, and don't bring anything, just bring your phone. So you go in there and your flip-flops and your shorts and... Yeah. <laughs> and then they do it the next morning. And how long's the surgery? Apparently it's about six hours. That um, takes some getting your head round. Look, it's not for the faint-hearted. And I remember being wheeled into theatre and this piece was... Absolutely incredible. I got this verse early on in the journey, Matthew 6, 34. Give your entire attention to what God is doing right now and don't get worked up about what may or may not happen tomorrow. God will help you deal with whatever hard things come when the time comes. Mm. What's the reference again? Matthew 6, 34. Mm, and it is the message. Yeah, I fair. like the message. Yeah. <laughs> but as I was being wheeled into theatre... Mm. And I slept that night. That was the weird thing. I slept. Wow. 
because I just thought, well, you know, Lord, I either go to meet you early or I get through this thing and have a few more years and see my grandchild grow up, mm. second grandchild. But, mm. yeah, that's how I felt being wheeled into theatre. I felt really calm, and I, I really put that down to God and his spirit because there was a lot to be anxious about. For sure. Mm. And so how did the surgery go? Well, it was successful. Yep. <laughs> I mean, they've only taken out one lung and they took out the better one because the disease I've got, they don't get good outcomes when they do a double lung transplant. Okay. So I've still got a dodgy one on the okay. side that's operating, not operating much. Mm. And I've got a nice big new one here. Mm. And, um, yeah, I mean, you know, it's, it's challenging, the whole recovery process. So you're in ICU for a while and then you go to a ward and then you go to rehab mm. and then you come home. Yeah. So how long would that process have taken before you got back home? It was less than two months. <clears throat> okay. Yeah. And then how was your mobility and that kind oh, of thing? Oh, great. I mean, they're hauling you out of bed on day two. So there's a lot of emphasis on getting fit. And I'm, I'm pretty much, if you tell me jump, I'll say how high. <laughs> so, you know, I'm probably the perfect candidate for a transplant because there's a lot of rules around it. Yeah. Or advice. And you're and like, yes, sir. I'm like, yeah, yeah, I'll do that, <laughs> I'll do that, I'll do that. So when they said get moving, I got moving, even though you thought you <laughs> You're going to collapse, but mm. you've got to remember why you're doing it. Mm. And, um, yeah. But, again, God was with me in all of that. There was times in ICU where I, the pain was incredible and I couldn't sleep. And I was saying, oh, Lord, where are you? Where are you? I just need you right now. And then I'd wake up four hours later. And to me, it was like he just put me to sleep. Oh, that's beautiful. So there was lots of things like that. So... Now, do you have to take lots of medication and that sort of thing? Oh, yeah, I've got truckloads of it. Yeah, like how you many pills a day? You swap one set of challenges for another. Okay. So I've swapped dying prematurely with an extension. This isn't, it's only an extension because at some point my body's trying to figure out rejection. Mm. So I'm on these meds that also may cause other problems. Um, you know, more prone to cancer. My liver's taking a thrashing. Um, all that stuff. So... But, you know, it's totally worth it. Yeah. And I find it's manageable. Yeah. yeah. Somebody passed away. Yeah. And their family gave consent for me to keep living. And I totally respect and appreciate that. And yeah. so you do your best to stack the odds. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm sounding must... transactional again, but you do your best to try and... But I do remember lying in ICU and just saying, lung... God and I welcome you. Welcome to our body. Welcome to our body. That's neat. And um, I just keep saying that every now and then. We want you here. Yeah, definitely. Because my body will be wanting to get rid of it. Power of blessing, mm. right? Blessing mm. your body. Blessing the new organ that you've been gifted mm. with. I watched something where you had talked about, uh, and you just touched on it earlier, about losing your dear granddaughter. Is it Sophie? Mm. Yes, yeah, Sophie Ray. Sophie Ray. Mm. And um, you made mention that you felt with the grief and that you went through with that, did it in a way kind of help prepare you for this? Yeah, I think it, that was an awful time. Um, yeah, sometimes in life, Lizzie, there's just no answers. Mm. Stuff happens. Definitely. And none of us saw this coming. So A, it was a big shock. But the grief just went on and on. And I remember for months... I didn't realise how sad I was. I do remember managing to come to work. Mm. And this is, a, you know, separate from what my kids were going through, which was just terrible for them. Yeah. But it's hard for the grandparents too. And I remember managing to come to work, and we ate so badly during that time, because mm. neither of us had the energy to cook oh, when we got home. So here's my advice. If you have someone going through that, at least just turn up with a meal whether they let you or not. Yeah, definitely. Because I tend to go, oh, we'll be fine, we'll be fine. But we weren't fine. No. One night I remember we felt duty-bound to go out for a birthday thing or something with somebody. And we saw a cruise ship heading out at Narrow Neck. And I was sitting on a swing and I was laughing and I suddenly realised this is the first time I've felt happy in months. Mm. But I have to say, even though it was an awful time, it was the beginning of really that move from transactional to soul-based faith where I had to go deeper. Mm. And there's this quote that, you know, God lives in the depths so if you choose to stay on the shallows, you won't find him. Amen. And I found him. I have found him in the depths of adversity. But you can take that into happier times too. True. Yeah.
it's always the way. I know I found in my own life the, the hard things that I've been through that mm. that's where I encounter him the most and the most painful things. Well, he's got our attention, I suppose. Well, we're kind of so desperate, aren't we, that it's like we kind of recognise there's nobody else that can help me right now. It's God or, or nobody. Yeah, and I think we spend our lives putting on things that we think we need to fit in. Mm. And we forget the essence of who Lizzie or Naomi was born to be. And in a way, a lot of this adversity strips that away and you're back to that person you were before you tried to fit in, Yeah. before you tried to be what the world wanted. And you start to discover who God really made you to be. Yeah. Because a lot of stuff doesn't matter anymore. Yeah. What have you discovered about yourself in that journey? That's... I've really got much more focused on people and listening more and stopping and trying to just make them feel like this is a song I'm listening to at the moment from the Potter's Porter's Gate, I think that's what they're called. Will you sing over me? Sing over me it's called. And it's about, you know, when I've lost hope, when I've lost my sense of who I am, when this is in particular with mental health, when I'm mm. feeling distressed, will you sing over me? Will you remind me who I am? Will you remind me of what I can do? Mm. Will you remind me that this isn't gonna last? And I felt a real nudge to try and do that with people. Yeah. Not for them, but with them. Yeah, that's so powerful. Um, because I think with God in me, I'm probably his solution for certain people that I come across just by being there and loving them mm. and seeing them. And that mm. might be part of their journey towards him. And um, I've had a funny experience. Like my mood was starting to drop a bit at the start of the year because I'd broken my pelvis from coughing because the drugs gave me osteoporosis. And I still had a cough and I ended up with a broken pelvis, so I couldn't do my walks that I always do, and that's really important for my wellness, but also my well-being. And so I decided to go to the local pool, because I'd been told, if you can be weightless, that'll help. Mm. And I went really early to avoid the crowds. There was this whole community of people there that within two weeks I was their best friend, and when you walk in, they're leaping out, and, and some of them are 90, <laughs> giving you fist punts and all that. And I found God there. Wow. I can't really explain that, and probably some theologian will tell me off. But I, I felt God reaching out to me through some of these people, just yeah. by being loving. Yeah, community. Yeah. And we're all made in the image of God, right? Exactly. So you're just, yeah. you're just receiving that sort of essence from mm. people. I, I totally relate to and that. And the mood lifted, and... Um, now I feel I have to go because otherwise I'll be letting them down. You know? Yeah, oh, that's a wonderful thing. Yeah. Do you have moments where you do get, I know you said you're very extroverted, mm. and, but do you have some moments where you do get really down? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's lonely. This, anybody going through adversity will tell you it's lonely. Yeah. You can have good people in your life that won't understand because you have to go through it. Yeah. Again, I've just found God so much more present within me in those times. But yeah, no, I get, I get quite down to it, quite mm. sad. Mm. And um, I mean, it takes a lot of energy for me to stay well. Yes. And a lot of energy for me to stay upbeat. Mm. And sometimes that just gets the better of me because I probably do too much. Yeah. But I'm much more reflective now. For somebody who's listening today, Naomi, mm. and hearing your story, they possibly on a very different story themselves. Yeah. Um, but nevertheless, going through challenging times. Uh, what would you say to that person? The first thing would be accept it. Don't fight it. Mm. This might be an invitation for you to go deeper with God. And even research would say, whether it's a God thing or not, if you can be realistic and stare it in the face and acknowledge what it is, yeah. that'll help you. Then secondly, I would say find some things to be grateful for, because even in my worst times, I could find something to be grateful for. Like maybe the nurse would be nice or the tea lady was chatty or, you mm. know, poor tea lady, because I'm an extrovert. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then thirdly, for me, it was serve. So I remember when I went and I found out I had a broken pelvis and it was right on Christmas and I was like, really? Honestly? And I had to be in a wheelchair. I bawled all the way home. So that was me accepting it, but grieving it, mm. accept and grieve it. And then I thought, well, what can I be grateful for? Well, I can be grateful that um, my head's okay. I could be grateful that other parts of me are fine, family are coming for Christmas. 
And then I went home and got John to prop up a stool by the um, stove and I made lemon honey for our friends like I do every Christmas. So I served and my mood lifted. But I've kept that little thing going mm. when it's really hard. I think, okay, what's hard? It's hard. And I'm going to grieve that because it's not fair. It feels hard. Yeah. Then I'm going to think about what can I be grateful for? And usually there's a God component to that. And then I'm going to do something. So whether it's go to the pool or ring up a friend or let others in on the journey. Yeah. So I decided not to be secretive about it. I decided, yeah. I didn't get up and make big announcements about it, but I let my nearest and dearest in on the journey. Yeah. And honestly, they were fantastic. What an amazing conversation with Naomi. So incredible hearing her journey, a really hard journey. And yet I love the life that she is experiencing through her relationship with God. She seems to have come to this place of recognising what she can control and what she can't control, giving it over and handing it over to God, trusting in God and not trusting in the outcome. That's a really difficult thing to do and I think we can all take our courage and wisdom from Naomi's journey and apply it to the challenges we face in our own lives. See you next time on Finding the Light.